Hello again. Um, so the average six-year-old knows more about technology than their parents. But what's the real impact of pervasive digital platforms on the lives of young people? That's the topic of the next panel, entitled The Myth of the Digital Native, which is chaired by the wonderful Emma Mulqueeny, founder of the Rewired State Group. Please welcome her and her panelists onto the stage. I'm Emma Mulqueeny, and um, I founded the Rewired State Group um, uh, in 2009. It wasn't a group then. Um, we just ran a few hack days. And um, as a part of that, um, I set up Young Rewired State because we didn't have enough young people coming and playing with open data and engaging with government. And, um, and so Young Rewired State uh, was born and has been going since 2009. So over that period of time, I've had the opportunity to work with what you would probably call a digital native. I'm not sure. I mean, you know, these kids know how to program, but they are very specialist children. They're the bedroom programmers. Um, but through the course of that, but also through having a 16-year-old uh, daughter now and a 12-year-old and a um, daughter as well, I am surrounded by young people who are supposed to be the digital natives. And I have two, you know, I have the, the kind of, you know, the, the both sides of it. I have um, my daughter that has absolutely no interest whatsoever in anything geeky. And then I have um, Young Rewired State where I have thousands, or over a thousand kids now. Who, um, who just live for that. So um, I've kind of been absorbed in this world for a while, and um, I started to notice some trends and a difference between the kids that were born um, in 97 and after. So the ones that were actually born with social media, so the way that they identify themselves, the way that they communicate, the way that they learn, the way, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between the social media native and their peers and us. Um, but I am not seeing a huge kind of digital native divide between kids that are kind of born earlier than that, who are supposed to be digital natives and um, apparently know anything. In fact, it's, it's very different because they're just consumers of digital. So that's where I come from in all of this, but I've talked about it a lot. I'm going to be chairing this today. We are starting late, um, so we'll try and scamper through, but if there's any questions, we will take them. Um, and we've also got Monica, who is joining us um, over the internet. So um, I'm going to start with you. Monica. No, I'm starting with Monica. Um, Monica, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, I'm Monica Bolger, and I'm video conferencing in from California. I'm a fellow at the Harvard Berkman Center for Internet and Society and a research associate at the Oxford Internet Institute. And I study digital literacy across age groups. And in particular, I look at how people evaluate information, what they choose to trust. And I also look at children's rights, and so protecting children and providing um, opportunities for participation and creative use. And um, just to pick up on what Emma said, I think that's really interesting to um, differentiate between kids born after 97 um, and those born before. Um, I, I'd like to caution us when we're talking about uh, teens and youth that they're not a homogenous group, which is something my colleague, uh, Dr. Allen House, will, uh, will be speaking about, uh, particularly in their, in their social capabilities and in their um, information evaluation capabilities, even though they have um, technology skills. So we've seen two-year-olds using iPads, right? And everywhere we go, it just seems that the kids have this facility with technology, but what they may not have are um, the, the, the social skills, the, the ability to evaluate information and know, know what to trust, um, how to uh, respond when content is upsetting, um, and that sort of thing. And so that's something I hope we discuss further today. Thanks, Monica. Okay. And, um, and so now we'll pass on to you, Helen, you can introduce okay. yourself. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ellen Halsper. I'm an associate professor at the London School of Economics, just across the river, actually, um, is where my office is. Um, most of my research uh, focuses on digital exclusion, actually, digital disengagement. It's been mentioned a few times before uh, during the uh, previous presentations and panels, so that was interesting to pick up on. And my focus in that area really is, is to look at how uh, people or groups who are marginalized offline or who are kind of excluded offline um, 
how they engage or disengage in the technological world. And this is not just about access, this is about the literacy, the skills that they have, um, what they actually do when they are online, which spaces they feel comfortable in, how design of these spaces might make them feel comfortable, how the other people in these spaces might make them feel comfortable or uncomfortable. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at that, that bridge and the, the overlap between these offline and the online worlds. And one of the uh, interests that I have in relation to the digital native, and um, I guess I have to confess, I wrote a paper almost titled The Myth of the Digital Native, so that kind of tells you what my standpoint on that is. But it's, um, is that um, this idea of vulnerability, offline vulnerability and online vulnerability, and that when we talk about the digital native as somebody born in a specific era, we kind of glance over the fact that there's a lot of young people who have um, problems that um, can be social, psychological, that can uh, make them more vulnerable in an online environment. And there's a lot of varieties of young people out there. We've already heard you talk a little bit just in your, you know, the relatively small circle. And that we tend to forget that when we talk about the digital native as a concept, right? That we say, okay, these are kids. Look at, as Monica said, how they use this technology, these tools. It seems so easy. They seem to know what they're doing. And to go back uh, on the uh, kind of the, the introduction or the almost the reason for this panel that we're having today in the Ofcom report, we see a lot of kids also feeling that they have to say that they're confident, especially when an adult asks them that, right? They say, I'm young, I should know how to use technology. And that we caution a little bit against that because there's some kids who really are struggling online, not just in the social sense, but also they don't actually necessarily have the skills. And sometimes they do feel confident and sometimes it's not knowing that we don't know that is actually the real problem. So there's a real role to have in discussions with parents and educators in this whole kind of debate around the digital natives and this, the world that young people nowadays live in. So I think these are kind of the points that I think would be really interesting also to hear what the people here today have to say, say about that and what their experiences are. Cool, and Eleanor. Hello, <laughs> um, my name is Eleanor Fogden and I'm 17. I'm currently studying my A2s in drama, media and sociology. I thought it'd be interesting to actually count how much social media I use in preparation for today. Um, I have Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Gmail and Blogger for three different blogs, a YouTube account, Ask FM, as well as streaming music and films. So in total, I use about 13 different platforms that I'm actually aware of. So I kind of consider myself as part of a technology generation. If you said to me that Wi-Fi was going to be cut off, I would probably cry a lot and wait for it to come back on. But I, I do have a real love-hate relationship with the internet, even though it does help me a lot. It, it helps me apply for uni, and it helps me find specialist dyslexic resources that I need f for school, um, and also helps me in development for things like drama. Uh, there's lots of things that are very, very wrong with the internet that I've learned from personal experience. Uh, it can expose those who are most vulnerable to things like pornography, to self-harm and suicide blogs on websites such as Tumblr. Um, and also it can be really inconvenient for lots of things as well. I found out about the death of a friend on Facebook and I also lost another friend uh, through the use of self-harm suicide blogs as well as pro-ana blogs on Tumblr. And also as a user of Tumblr, I've had a lot of negative experience with it as well. Um, I've received messages about my appearance, really derogatory messages about certain parts of my body. Uh, it seemed really, really disturbing images that no one should be able to see. And also just some really horrible things have happened relating to Tumblr in particular. I bring this up because my original message to the South Bank relating to the digital native was about an exhibition about Tumblr and about the negative and the positive experiences that people go through with it. And that's all I really have to say about the internet. And please feel free to ask me any questions if you, if you want to. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, I just want to um, clarify, and I'm just going to ask actually all of the panel um, to, to define it themselves. Um, because I think there is a difference between a digital native 
and a social digital native, so the social media that you're talking about, Eleanor. And um, I think just for a point of clarity before we carry on, I think we just need to understand who we're talking about. So Monica, if I go to you first, how would you define a digital native? I would use the, the definition among academics is those born after 1980. So it's, it's more of an age-based definition. And then, um, and then there's, there's sort of this assumption that they're innately more skilled in using technologies, which I, I don't necessarily agree with, but um, that's, the defini that's the working definition I usually use. By age. Yeah. Okay. What's your definition? Okay. Um, I would say, kind of following up on what Monica said, my definition, my working definition, stepping beyond uh, the kind of age-based definition on, on when you're born. It's, um, it's more to do with uh, kind of the skills that you have and the comfort that you have in being online. And uh, like some of the research that we've done and uh, you know, the experience that we have show that actually age or generation is not as much of a defining factor in, in that level of skill and comfort. Yes, how long you have been aligned, how, uh, online and how broadly you use the technology, how embedded it is in your everyday life kind of influences how comfortable and how um, confident you are in that area. So for me, it would be more like looking at, you know, do, can, can we manage the technology in a ways that we can take up all these opportunities that are there and kind of avoid the risks and the harm that might come from those risks when we're online. So I want to step away a little bit from the age-based definition because we, in our research, we show that things like, for example, um, uh, kind of, the family background where you come from, whether you've been surrounded by technology or um, kind of the school and the educational experience that you've had are far more important in determining that comfort and confident, confidence online than when you were born. And in the previous panel, when we talked about Africa, there's kind of really big differences within the same generation that would make some digital natives and others not digital natives in that sense. So I think for me, that's the working definition. Yeah. Cool. Alan? I think it's a bit difficult to define digital native, especially if you're talking about age as well. Mm. Because to be honest, even though I do use a lot of social media, I'm absolutely useless when it comes to a computer, mm. which kind of goes against the stereotype of most teenagers nowadays saying they know everything about technology, when actually most of them really don't. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think it's bad to think we all do know about. Mm technology, because most of us mm. don't. I think it just kind of depends from person to person, really. And I think it's quite hard to put definition on it. Yeah, I just, I just think it's important to get some clarity around this, because you know, I think certainly for my generation, you know, I, I mean, I grew up with the BBC Micro, and I knew a lot about computers. Like, but I am you know, kind of completely technical, naive as when it comes to social media, less so now, because I've forced myself to learn. Um, but I think that there is a difference when we talk about digital um, natives and, and you know it is a common phrase it is commonly used and, and I would say that there is a there is a very big difference between those that know how to use computers so like you know the people that grew up with things like um, the BBC Micro or even you know the, the early computers basically before Apple came along and just made everything really beautiful and easy to use and actually um, the divide between the digital native and a person who is not digitally savvy I think now is is far more about um, social space and um, and and far less about use of the actual technology um, so I, I think um, yes yeah, so you yeah. want to uh, because just, I'd like, just like to follow up on that, and I hate doing this, but I guess I have to do the plug because then people know where I got this information. Uh, we just published a report last week uh, with, um, in collaboration with the University of uh, Oxford, the Oxford Internet Institute, and the 20 University in the Netherlands, where we talked about measuring digital skills, measuring digital literacy. What is it that we're talking about? Because it's not this one thing. It's not like, oh, you know, I know how to turn the computer on and operate a mouse and I know how to do some coding and then I'm fine, right? Um, so one of these things that we looked at in this report is what are these different types of skills that you actually need to be able to move around all these different spaces online? And um, we looked also at what the differences were between different generations in, in terms of like, and we see, for example, there's one skill that we call like information navigation skills. Like, can you find information? Do you know which information to trust? Things like that. We found very little difference between generations there. Um, and this is age-based genera uh, generations, obviously. The, the larger differences we found in 
things that had to do with the operational skills, actually. Knowing, like, you know, the iPad and how can you do, you know, which buttons work, where the younger generation was a lot more comfortable. And I'm going to check this. I don't want to say something that's wrong, obviously. Um, and we also found quite a big differences in the creative skills. So in creating content and uploading them and feeling comfortable sharing that online, there's also young people do that quite a lot more. Okay. Interesting, the differences in the, uh, in the social types of skills were actually smaller than in those other areas. So because a lot of these social skills are about etiquette, about norms, about how to behave, how, what do you say when to who? Who do you know how to share things with? Who do you know how to uh, contact when you have a question of a personal nature or something that you want to kind of improve your own personal well-being? And the interesting thing is that once adults are online and you control for how long they've been there and what kind of things they use, is that actually young people resemble these adults quite a lot. So they might be on all these platforms, but the, the kind of skills and the literacy that you need to use these platforms in a way that's good for you um, is not that much different. So I think we, we also should step away a little bit from that fact is that all the stuff that we knew in the past about how we made friends or is it okay to say something to somebody else or who do I go to when I want to ask for help? These rules and norms, let's call them etiquette values, they're still valid. It's not that they're not valid anymore now that it's digital. And that's one of the risks of this kind of discussion about the digital native is that like some adults and teachers, parents, they feel like I cannot talk to the kid anymore about friendship or bullying because it's all online now and I have no idea about the online. But actually a lot of these things are still really valid and we have had experience. We all were teenagers once, uh, you know, and I think um, a lot of these things we can really relate to about yeah. feeling uncomfortable with yourself. So I think that's a really important thing to see. And then, like, you know, I'm a researcher, so I try to, like, do, try and figure that out through, through research. But I think a lot of the experiences also from what we've heard from you are kind of that. Like, there is there's these things that we have been doing for centuries since we've been living with other people in, in communities that are still really valid also in that online environment. Yeah, I, I, I completely, you know, I, I think we need to kind of take that digital word yeah. out of it really because, yeah. as I said to you earlier, bullying offline is just exactly the same as bullying online. It just might be more direct. <laughs> um, Monica, I just, in your introduction, you were talking about two-year-olds using iPads and stuff like that, but obviously not then growing up with it or not having enough knowledge to kind of sit behind, uh, that sits behind that use. And I think that, that connects with some of the stuff that you're talking about. So have you got anything that you wanted to add to what Ellen was saying about the, um, about the knowledge that these young people need to have or that they, we assume that they have and that the, perhaps they don't have from what you're seeing where they seem like they're quite savvy? Um, but perhaps might not be um, not be quite so emotionally savvy, let's say. I, I just wanted to follow up on, on, on one quick point first. One, one interesting finding when we actually test, when we, give, when we give adults and kids a task, an information search task, for example, or an evaluation task, one interesting thing um, that we're finding is even if in a survey, um, and this happens with college students, with adults, with, with kids, even if in a survey they say they know how to evaluate credibility, and so, so they, know, they know the steps, right? They know to look for um, where, where the web's, you know, who's publishing the website, um, look for who's the names citing it if, if, if they're aware of, you know, credible websites. Um, even, even if they demonstrate that knowledge, when, when they're actually given a task, they tend to go for the, the fastest site, you know, the site that's showing up first in Google or the first five. Um, so even even uh, so, so here's something where adults and children are similar, and, and it just seems to be something that's occurring. You know that, that we do in life too is is we sort of find the easiest, and, and we're not necessarily always implementing the the, um, the strategies that we know will protect us or will will lead to the best information. And so I I just wanted to say that because I think that's that's important when we're talking about. Um, digital literacy or, or literacy generally is that even even if we sort of know what we're supposed to do, we don't always follow that. And, and that that's sort of something that happens, you know, with with any of the social media and um, connecting with people that we may not know, even though we know that, you know, that's probably not the best thing to do. We also we, we tend to do it anyway. Um, as far as um, I, I think I got us off topic. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> 
um, as, as far as uh, studies that are showing I, studies that are showing kids use I think it I think we should also mention um, the EU kids online work um, that studied 25,000 children in 25 countries um, that Ellen is, is actually deeply involved with and um, I've, I've been using the research for projects with UNICEF um, what we see is that uh, that that in countries where, where the parents aren't as um, involved with the children's use or as, as savvy, um, the kids the kids may feel that they they understand how to better use the internet and um, or also than their parents. So then they may not be seeking guidance from their parents. Um, and and these kids are still are, are reporting being bothered by content conduct and contact. Um, online and um, they may not have them the resources to help them cope and, um, and, and respond. So they might not know, you know, simple things like um, protecting their privacy, not, not providing information about where they live, not providing specifics um, uh, about, about where they're going, um, sharing photos that might indicate um, where they spend time. Um, and they might not also have um, someone to report things to, so they, they, might, they might not report it at all. Um, yeah. 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 I think that's really yeah. cool. Um, I wanted to ask you because you write, don't you? You you write your blogs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to ask you what it is that drives you to write, and then what drives you to choose which channel you publish yourself on. So when I say write, I mean not just long form blogs, but everything that you're actually kind of producing and then how you make that decision. Mm. Well, in terms of actual blog writing, um, I was using Blogger anyway for my media coursework because it's actually part of your assessment. You have to write a blog to show what you're doing with your filming. and um, So I had to do that anyway. And I thought, well, I really like baking, so I might as well start a baking blog. Gives me a chance to eat more cake as well. Um, and then I thought, I'll do a beauty blog as well because I... I'm really interested in that field. So for long form, definitely using Blogger is the best. But for Facebook, I only write things that are quite like, personal for my friends to see. Uh, I hardly ever use Twitter, because I actually don't understand how it works. Um, Tumblr is very difficult to describe about why I use it. I think the only reason why I did use it is because my friend had it in year nine, I think, and she was like, oh, you should check it out, it's really good. Um, but the, the thing with Tumblr is you, you don't just put bits of writing up, you put pictures, you put videos, you can reblog with, with people with similar interests. But I think when it comes to Tumblr, especially now, you have to be really careful with what you write because you could write, oh, I'm having a really bad day, and then all the wrong types of blogs will start following you and you will get pictures and videos of people, um, you know, doing yeah. really horrible things to themselves. So when I'm writing on social media in particular, I do like to keep in mind what I'm writing, why I'm writing it, and who could actually be looking at it. Mm -hmm. So it's and how, how do you how do you cope with you want to you want to ask no, her question? That's fine. You can ask her a question. Her, 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 her her question. Let me just ask her, maybe the same question. Um, I just wanted to ask you how you how you cope with um, anything negative or something that not necessarily negative, mm. but but how do you cope with actually protecting your space online? Well, I didn't very well for a couple of years. I didn't at all. I um, well, with Facebook, I have all the privacy settings on because both my parents also are friends with me on Facebook. That's the only reason why I'm allowed it. Um, but with Tumblr, it's, you can't actually really control the privacy. Um, so, How, so, do, so you use just kind of shutting it down and going away, turning it off rather than kind of I, allowing I it into your space? I can't actually turn Tumblr off because I'm kind of addicted to it, okay. which is very unfortunate. <laughs> um, but if something really bad had happened, I would just stay off it for a few days. But it kind of got to a point where there was so much bad stuff happening that I could not ignore it. But instead of clicking the report button, which is really difficult to find as well, um, I just kind of either replied to the person being unkind to me 
or I'd just delete it or I would just get into such a sort of bad state of mind where I wouldn't be able to separate it from my social media life and my personal life as well. It just sort of merged into one. So it's quite difficult to protect yourself on websites like that. Yeah. Um, and especially when, I mean, I never told school what was going on. Um, my parents really didn't know until a couple of months ago um, what was going on on Tumblr. But the problem is, they, if I did say, well, I don't know what to do, they'd just say, find the report button. Well, right. the report button seems to be non-existent on Tumblr, so. Right, yeah. Right, OK. It's difficult. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> it is difficult. Actually, my question wasn't exactly about that, because these are quite complex things that you're describing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, I, I was just wondering how you learned. Like, were you all on your own, and you figured it out kind of stumbling along? Or, or did you, um. like? <laughs> Who did you talk to? Where did you go online to find like ways of figuring this out? You mentioned it a little bit, but no. I fine. didn't really sort of look for any advice. Mm. It kind of got too late by the time. Yeah. It's like I only I told I told my counsellor I was like I don't know what to do anymore, and she yeah. was like, well, report it. I was like, there's no report button, so yeah. I, I don't know what to do. I, I did tell a few friends, and they some of them actually started following me on Tumblr to make sure everything was okay, which in a sense was strange, but really nice to know that they were there. Because there does come a point where it's just numbers that people are following you, but um, knowing that there were like one or two people mm. who I genuinely knew following me was really nice, mm. and I think was what I needed. And I also, at one point, sat through with one of my friends and went through my Tumblr and unfollowed the blogs that I really shouldn't have been following. And that did make a difference, but. Some of them still pop up occasionally, yeah. but I just have to ignore it now. It's the best thing you can do with things like that is to ignore it. But if it does come to a point where it becomes, you can't ignore it, you, you've got to sort it out straight away. Because mm. frankly, I left it far too long. I, I think, see, I think, well, you know, you're right when you're saying it's, it's you know, it's, it's quite complicated stuff that you're talking about here, because I think, you know, you're being exposed earlier to um, decisions that you have to make to protect yourself. Um, but also then having to kind of, you know, learn through difficult, you know, different means of doing that. And I guess it's kind of backing up what you were saying, the fact that she's using her community. It is an offline and not so you use your friends in real life who are therefore then following you mm. online to kind of protect you in the same way that they would perhaps go with you into the loo if there was kind of like some girls that were in the loo that were kind of, yeah. with, you know, so that kind of, that online offline line begins to blur again. Um, right, I'm, mm, we've got seven minutes. Um, are there any burning questions from, yes, <laughs> wow.